Shotia, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I can hear you. I see that you're at UCLA now. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. How long have you? Is this your is this your second year there? Yeah, yeah. This is my second year. I, I got the email from SIP about the shadow the scientist thing, and I was like, it's been a while. So yeah. <laughs> You should consider coming up for our reunion. We have something on, uh, it's on December 15th, or uh, December, yeah, 15th. I think it's a Thursday. We check. I believe it's a... I might be back home. I see. I see. Yeah, that's right. Our term ends well before that. Our term ends on the, I think, 8th or 9th. Yeah, it's the same for me. I'm flying back, I believe, on the 8th. So I'm going to be in India. Got you. You should connect remotely then uh, by Zoom. Yeah. It's gonna I will. Happen. I will. Uh, it's scheduled for the 15th, Thursday, the 15th. It's good to see you. I saw you sign up and I said I haven't heard from you in a while. So wonderful. Um, so there's a team of us at Tech um, this, this evening and the next three evenings. And we are recording this session. And <clears throat> we're also going to run a dedicated STS session for a school group in Kashmir um, later tonight. So it's around, um, let's see, it's 9.30 for you in California. So at 11, no, at 12.30, California time, let's stop that session for an hour, 12.30 to 1.30. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'm gonna be asleep by then. Of course, of course, yeah. No, we'll record it. We'll record it, we'll put it on our STS webpage. But it'll be a bilingual session in Hindi and English. And uh, because it's a, it's a school that's run by the Indian Army, uh, about 90, 90 kilometers, South southeast of uh, Srinagar, so it's in a an area that is quite dangerous, really. It's sort of con army controlled, and because there's a lot of um, cross border terrorism and going on there, so it's a it's a school for civilian children, but it's run by the army. That's pretty cool. I was I'm curious about the bilingual aspect, so. Do you have people on your team who will be speaking in Hindi? Loosely speaking on our team, it's someone who's volunteered to do this, uh, who's a physics major in Pennsylvania. He's in his same as you, sophomore year. Uh, but he grew up in Bihar, and Hindi is his first language. English is his second language, so he's he's going to... and But because he's a physicist, no. Uh, what are you studying at UCLA? Uh, so I'm doing uh, a BSc in astrophysics and, in, and, a, and a BA in English. Wow. But the English is just for fun. Um, but yeah, if you need help, although I haven't really um, been involved with this stuff for like a year, I do speak Hindi. That's so fantastic. I, might, I, I may take you up on that because these are actually paid positions. So we would pay you for your time. And... Um, be, that's what uh, these are. So these uh, the, there's this category of thing called STS, so Shadow the Scientist, Subject Matter Expert. So if you're if you're studying, and what what I've done, uh, so Rohit is the guy who's going to be doing this today. Uh, I shared the proposal with him, the tonight's proposal with him, and um, but we have talked before about what kind of science we'll do, etc. So he has some background. I think these are primary school children, so it's actually going to be uh, quite, uh, you know, sort of very basic description of what we do, not not many of the technical details. So that is actually perfect. I can't be paid because of visa stuff. Uh, oh, because we can't. No, no. That... Uh, we can pay international students who are not who are not even in the U.S. So we do it through an honorarium system. So I, I'll oh, find, out okay. more. find out more. I'll let you yeah, know. Um... Uh, I'm pretty sure that. Uh, uh, we've crossed this bridge even for students who are outside the U.S. So if we can do it for students who are outside the U.S., we can do it for students who are on a student visa here. 
Yeah, I would love to help out with like teaching children and all of that because recently I've gotten really interested in education. And uh, actually, I don't know if you have heard about this, but there's this big science fair at UCLA exploring your universe. And I recently led a booth there and I taught like kids like from age ranges five to 15 about the Big Bang and the evolution of the universe. And I really enjoyed it. So I think I can help out definitely with like teaching a younger audience. So yeah, I'd love, love to involve you. Yeah, yeah, please do, please do. And um, who who have you taken classes from so far at UCLA? Uh, so right now I'm taking uh, Astro 81 with Professor Andrea Ghez. Okay. Um, so it's been great talking to her and like learning more about research and just a lot of other things in the scientific community. That's the only, okay, There's I've taken another Astro class, but it doesn't count towards my major anymore. Uh, have you, uh, I don't know if you know Professor Brad Hansen. Yeah, I know. Um, I actually, I know Andrea and Brad very well. Andrea yeah, and I are exact would. contemporaries. We got our faculty yeah. positions the same year, etc. So, say hello to her when you uh, when you talk to her. Next name for Brad. Brad works on white dwarfs. Andrea works yeah. on the Galactic Center, of course. But um, no, it's just yeah. astronomy is such a small community. I know them both very well. Yeah, I think I mentioned you because I was talking to Professor Gaz about. Um, just like previous research work that I've done. And I mentioned you and she became really happy. She she started smiling. She was like, I know Raja. And I was like, oh, wait, yes, UC system. They probably know each other. <laughs> yeah, no, we've known exactly because of that. It's because we're both in the UC system. We've known each other for, you know, we've both been in the UC system for close to 30 years, so. Yeah, let her know that you said hi. Uh, I have a please class do. with her tomorrow, so. Please do, please do. And, and um, you know, this is also, and Brad used to work closely with one of my postdocs, um, Jason Calorai. So if you see Brad, you can tell him I said hello also. Yeah, um, I haven't seen Professor Hansen in a while, but I do know his office is right next to Professor Gazes. So yeah, if I see him. <laughs> this is great. Um, and you were at DPS in, in Delhi? Oh, yeah, in Greater Noida, but yeah, technically NCR. NCR, okay. Wow. Yeah, it's been really good coming to the States, and I feel like I finally, like, adjusted to UCLA. My first year was definitely very chaotic, and I really struggled a lot with, like, physics, astro, math, all of those requirements, and then I also like English, so now I feel like I'm more stable, and I'm branching out into extracurriculars. Like I started working with the Astro Society at UCLA. So I hold an opposite position there too. So I, I was gonna mention your STS stuff to them later so that we can start promoting Please. it. But then with the TA strike, it's kind of like, we're not doing anything at the moment. I want to share my screen and, well, actually I, I would share my screen, but I'm just looking at, um, I believe I wrote one of your letters in 2020. And I see over here that I see UCLA over here. Your class of 2025 at UCLA, right? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So that year I wrote letters for six SIP interns. And two of you were at UCLA. Marissa Lee is the other one. She was at Menlo School. Uh, so two are at UCLA, one's at Harvard, one's at Georgia Tech, and two are at Princeton. Those are the six people I wrote letters for last, uh, in not, not last year, but two years ago, 2020. How long will you be um, at home in India before you come back to the US? Uh, I usually go back for like winter, so I should be back first week of January and then like the quarter is going to start and then, yeah, and then I'll go back for the summer, probably, gotcha. if I don't have any internship plans or anything, then I will probably just go back home for the summer. Are you already involved in research or are you <laughs> looking I'm to trying to, I'm <laughs> trying to get involved with Professor Guest at the end of the quarter, we will see. Let me know um, if that happens because you could, you know, um, again, we could pay you as a SIP mentor. As, as what? A SIP mentor, 
over the summer? Oh, um, would that be, I'm just like, I had a lot of issues with like my visa stuff this summer because I did teach over the summer as well. Um, I taught like intro to computer science to um, high school girls. Um, and that was also like very tricky with the visa situation um, we're trying to work this out at our end because last year at least we could not pay uh, folks who were outside the u.s or who didn't have a u.s visa but we may be able to do that through we're, we're trying to figure this out ourselves um, yeah it's like i'm allowed to accept scholarships but not exactly not work for pay <laughs> that's exactly what we're trying to do is offer it as a fellowship or as an honorarium one, one, those are two, the two ways I think we can make it work. And even if I won't get paid, I'm just like in general, like pretty passionate about teaching. I, I really like discovered this very recently when I started tutoring people in physics for like the LALGBT center. I realized that I genuinely enjoyed like breaking down concepts and helping people understand things at a deeper level. So I do see myself like in the future, at least at the moment, my career goals include like getting into research and getting my PhD, becoming a professor, and hopefully teaching college students. That's my plan at the moment. Now, um, are you on the UCLA campus then? Your housing is on campus? Um, I moved out of the dorms, so I'm currently in the sorority house, but okay. yeah, technically like five minutes from campus. Gotcha. Westwood. Yeah. I'm going to share my screen so you can see what uh, data we've been collecting with the exact same setup that we're using tonight. Is it the same as like last time, like two years ago when I would join in? Yeah, depending on what instrument we were using back then. Um, we were sometimes using DMOS, sometimes ESI. I know we've done adaptive optics imaging with NERC2, so depending on the instrument. So what you're seeing here, these are 2D spectra taken with DMOS, and you can sort of read this like sentences in a textbook where you read from left to right in the top row, then you read from left to right into the second row. Yeah, all is... of this is definitely starting to make more sense now that I've like taken a couple of astro classes. Like you don't have to catch me up on spectra and how those things work anymore. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is a 2D spectrum and this is a 1D spectrum of the same object. And the white line is a spectrum of a star in in the uh, in this case in Andromeda. Um, well, it's either in Andromeda or in a galaxy that's a companion of Andromeda, so M32. M31 and M32 are the region in which this uh, particular star is. So from the velocity, we can tell which one it belongs to, but just from sky location, can't be sure. So based on this one's velocity, minus 214, looks like it's a member of M32 rather than M31. 31 has a much more negative velocity. And um, this is sort of a zoom in where you're seeing the calcium triplet. Um, you can see you can see this this dip, the dotted line uh, is the velocity if you if you shift the template to a velocity of minus 214.5 it matches the velocity of this object so that's what it that's what this is showing i should introduce you to our team here and stop sharing my screen for a moment because we are sort of we are at a stage where we're taking a series of long exposures with demos i'm not sharing the control software right now i can't switch to that but um, also wanted to check with Maxim. Could you tell us a little bit about it's an entire coincidence, not coincidence, but the fact that I've known Swatya for what two and a half years. That's um, and I know Lordrick, who's connected from Tanzania. Uh, Maxim, tell me a little bit about yourself. <laughs> I'm <clears throat> I'm a spectacular here. So uh, I'm just interested in physics and astronomy and I'm a just astronomer for last half a year. Uh, my background is uh, physics, but I worked, uh, I never worked as a physicist. Uh, so which part of the world are you in? In California. 
in California. I see, I see. Um, how did you find out about Child of the Scientists? Uh, you presented uh, on SVIS meeting a month ago or something oh, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, At Sacramento mm -hmm. Valley Astronomical Society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. I've been there. I see you connected. That was by Zoom, I remember. Yeah, yeah. It was a very pure connectivity, so I just wanted to, to connect again. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. We'll be doing this um, a few more times this month, and then again a few times in December. And this is going to be a regular thing. We'll be mm -hmm. doing this. Yeah, I, I saw the schedule on the side. So, yeah. Very good. Very good, Tim. Thank you. Thanks for connecting. And Rick, welcome back. Um, what time is it for you in Tanzania? It's uh, eight forty-six in the morning. In the morning. Morning. Okay. Yeah. How are you doing? Thank you for. I'm good. Yeah, thank you. Well. Thanks. Thanks for waking up early for this. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I think you had said you at some point we'll set up a dedicated session for the University of Dodoma undergraduates, right? At, uh, yeah, I'm working on that as well. So no problem, no problem. I, I yeah. wanted to make sure I hadn't missed anything. Mm -hmm. So I think we're registered for uh, for the session tomorrow. Oh, fantastic! So okay, that's the that's that's when the undergrads are gonna have some free time. Okay. And actually, I'm gonna have a, a be having a class at that time, so I'm gonna find a way to okay to balance <laughs> balance it out. It'll be the first uh, thing in the morning for them, right? For the students, right? Yes, It'll yes. be. Mm. Um, you said it's 8.45. Oh, yeah, you're exactly 12 hours then. No, no, yes. you're 13 hours. It's 7.45. 13 hours there. from Hawaii. Then. Yeah. 13, 13 from Hawaii. Okay. So it's going to be 8.30 to 10.30 in the morning. Okay. But I have a class starting at 9, so I'm going <laughs> to see how to balance it out. No problem. Mm -hmm. um, um, Lordrick is, um, let me, uh, to introduce you to Swatya. Swatya is a was a high school student in India when she worked with our science internship program. And this was in the summer of 2020. It was a virtual program that year because of the pandemic. Um, and uh, we worked on a research project together and Swathya is now an undergraduate at, in, in California, UCLA. So, and Roderick connected to one of my colleagues that you see Santa Cruz online started doing research together sort of just as Vatya, you worked with me through a program lodrick's case wasn't through a program but you worked with uh, xavier pachaska and uh after you finished your undergraduate or while you were an undergraduate student so <laughs> it's kind of in the middle so we finish our coursework in july I see. but then our degrees we are offered offer that uh in december so i'm gonna get my degree on first of december Oh wow! So, okay. but I was done with the schoolwork by then. So, I see. So, um, Xavier connected to uh, to a post baccalaureate program with the Maria Mitchell Observatory. I see. With Dr. Regina Jorgensen. Uh, have you heard of her? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I N G E R is the first name. R E G I N A. Oh, okay. And then J Jorgensen, you said is the last name? Jorgensen, yeah. Jorgensen, okay. Mm -hmm. so I've come across the name. I'm trying to remember what context. So she's the, she's the, the, the astronomer at the Maria Mitchell Observatory I see. I see. in Nantucket, Massachusetts. Nantucket. And uh, so, yeah, so I'm working as a postdoc there at the moment. And uh, X is supervising me on a on a DLA project. I see. It's a whole research team, but X is sure. <laughs> my supervisor. Yeah, yeah, so, so K KG on... and Sunil are also involved. No. <laughs> so uh, after getting the, uh, I was just invited to the Keck Demos run. Okay. I see. Uh, X was like, "Oh, this could be good for you. Do you want to come?" I was like, oh, "Sorry about that." Uh, uh, do you want to come and uh, watch the as uh, on the on cake? I was like, yeah, I'd love to. So, so that's how I got into cake. I see. Yeah. I was sharing my screen. I'll go back to sharing my screen. I was just showing some of the spectra we work with. So, it's 
So you can see that even though we tried to get a spectrum of this star, the one marked with red, we ended up getting spectra of three others. This one, this faint line at the below the star, this faint one above, and then this really bright one near the top of the slit. So I've been taking cryptic notes about these things. So this spectrum, uh, these very sharp dips over here are produced by titanium oxide in the atmosphere of the star. But you can see that the blue line and the white line line up perfectly in, in the horizontal direction, in the wavelength direction. So that means we measure the, the Doppler shift correctly and the star is moving towards us at 214.5 kilometers per second. And this is the, this is a star in, M32, I believe. Hello. Hello, hello, we're hello. You, we're giving you free food. Oh, wow. So let me take my um, Shadow the Scientist session that I shall introduce you to. Sure. I'm sharing my screen. I'll stop sharing for a moment. This is a small group today, but uh, Maxim is connected from, is a research astronomer is connected from, let me, let me turn off my virtual background here. Oops, sorry, that's not what I want to do. So, go ahead, I can hear you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm John Romero, I'm the Deputy Director and Chief Scientist here. Uh, just wishing you aloha and, and, and welcoming you to the, to the evening. Hope things are going well. Things are going well? Yeah. Things are going very well. Fantastic. Cool. And you, you don't know this, but you're connected to Lord Rick through Xavier Prochaska. <laughs> so- um, Oh, fantastic. You're a, you're a collaborator of X's and, I, and Lord, you're a close collaborator of X's. X and I have been working together for 25 years. Yeah. And X is his post back research advisor. Ah, Godric is in Dodoma, Tanzania. Okay. Um, so it's a global connection. Fantastic. Swathya was a <laughs> high school student. That's in, <laughs> Delhi Public School when mm -hmm. she was part of our high school program virtually. Mm -hmm. So she did research with me. She's now an undergraduate at UCLA. Oh, fantastic. And Maxim is connected from California. Cool. So we'll be doing our Kashmir session a little bit later, but I'll oh, do the others. And I haven't actually introduced anyone to anyone in the room. So yeah. people are welcome <laughs> to come here and say hello. Well, lo lovely to meet you all. We did take lovely that image of um, M33. It was spectacular. Mm -hmm. in the oh, oh, oh. Well. Yeah. yeah, but I want images of M33. <laughs> Can somebody send me a screen grab? Can you get that five screen grab? Well, yeah, I mean, however, because I, I know one person in particular. Julian, so, so we went to Yeah. So I, I saw Julian two weeks ago. I'm 31 and now I'm 33. It would be great to just send that to him and say, hey, got a picture for you. That's cool. That is so cool. We haven't forgotten you. We'll be back. So you're just looking at something else. <laughs> so I'm John. Margaret, nice to meet you. Laura, nice to meet you. Michael, we've met. Hey, nice to meet you. Hi. And this is everybody's Ed. Wow. Oh, no. ah, okay. 
we were at the swag place. Uh, yeah. Okay, did, did everybody get appropriate swag? Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Um, I'm going to be exceedingly rude because I have to start a meeting at six tomorrow. Okay. So some can call tomorrow. Too. Um, I mean, I'm 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 from Hopkins. So. No, I'm 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 the chair of the mask users group. We have our annual oh, meeting, uh, so I have to run that meeting tomorrow at six and see all the wonderful things that mask is doing for bubble wrap, etc. Unfortunately, I'm just yeah. I've got to go help tear down the rest of our event. But so enjoy your food. Seeing you. Yeah. I mean, that image looks lovely. So seeing must be too good. No, it's no. Not. Or is it blowing up? Or point not point not. No, I mean it's, it's coming down. It's coming down. So it was point eight six when we measured it, but I bet it's better now because that was when when the uh, uh, is that the No. Uh, yeah, the yeah, scene was the right now. Uh, so we, we were measuring point eight six. I think it's so. Down. Are you doing masks on the gravel right now? I'm doing the sky channel is Yeah, pretty cute. Mm -hmm. All right. Love it. All right. Well, I'll get out of your way. Okay. Have a wonderful evening. Thank Have you. a wonderful evening, everyone. Um, and you two folks are talking tomorrow afternoon. I will do. I will do my very best to try to get myself into that conversation. Maybe some flexibility. Can you get the afternoon that works for you? My primary flexibility is the beginning of. A vacation or having kids. And so uh, I will see whether or not what, what the afternoon looks like. No problem. My problem. Ed, Ed can speak for me very well. So thank you. All right. Well, well, good night, everybody. Do well. Bye. <laughs> Hi. Oh, yeah, please say hello to uh, Hi, everyone. I'm Margaret. I'm. um. Yeah, you should be. Yeah, I mean, they should be audible. They should hear you. Yeah, should. yeah, I'm on the observing team. I'm a postdoc, so I'm like a couple of years out of my PhD, and I do research at Caltech. And I'm helping out with the observations tonight, and then also I'll be on the next three nights studying stuff in M31, M33. These are these amazing connections. Swati is a is a Delhi connection. She's of course at UCLA now, but she was a high school student in Delhi when we were working together. Rodrik is connected to Xavier Pachaska, he's in Dodoma, Tanzania. Mm -hmm. And Maxim found out about us through Sacramento Valley Astronomical Society. I've given a couple of talks there. So he found out about Shadow the Scientist in the state of South California. That's it. Oh, and Yael is a high school student from Mountain View High School who does research with our group. So ah. she's in Mountain View. She's close to where I live. Hey, Yael. Hi. Sorry, I'm getting my laptop up and running, so I'll join on there. Turn on my camera soon. No problem. No problem. Let's parade through and okay. say hello. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Liv. I'm a second year grad student at Tufts University in Boston. This was my first time to Hawaii and my first time observing properly. Um, I'm already tired, <laughs> but it's only because I was traveling today. So hopefully the next uh, couple of nights will be better. Um, and yeah, that's my new. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> and in the next round of introductions, hi, I'm Lara. Uh, I'm a postdoc, a first year postdoc at Johns Hopkins University. But as you can probably tell from my accent, uh, I'm originally from Australia, which is fun. Um, and so I'm much more enjoying the climate in Hawaii, which is a lot closer to where it is in Australia than, than Baltimore is. <laughs> so I'm really enjoying it, actually being in like short, short sleeves. So that's good. And I'm on tonight uh, looking at stuff in stars in M31. Um, very excited to do like dynamics of these stars is my particular focus. And then I'm also helping out with the next few nights uh, in Margaret's program. So yeah, it's great to meet you all. Yael, yeah, we did take a spectrum of the, one of the RLRI, the one that we monitored the most. Um, we got a demo spectrum of it tonight, the beginning of the night. We have half nights, so 
we don't get the twilight and dawn periods for these half nights. We only get the twilight, the evening portion of the bright sky. So we could only do one RLR every night. That's great. Um, are you gonna reduce those or should we do that? Like at no, the end of the series of nights? No, I've been reducing, I've actually so far I've reduced everything that we've observed in 2022. In all the RL area reduced. So I just need to make the data available, the 1D spectra available to you guys. Um, okay, I'm actually, well, that's great. Um, um, I'm in the process of reducing everything. Uh, all the all the monitoring program stars, literally each and every one of them going back to December 2019, which is when we started the monitoring. Um, so we don't have to worry about running spec 2D and spec 1D. I'm running PyPit on them. They're going through fine. And the few spectra I've looked at so far look fine. Um, so I should be able to send those to you. Um, uh, so I'm doing this. Our goal is to reduce all of our M31, M33, Keck, Demos spectra and all the peripherals with that, like the RLRA, um, for the 20 years that we've been using Demos, going back to 2002. Uh, but the monitoring program doesn't go back that far. It just goes back to 2019. So the short answer is yes, we have those spectra uh, either already reduced or in the process of being reduced. That doesn't include tonight's observation, of course, because that will, um, but that'll get done as probably by this weekend. So we have a nice system going. I'm, I'm starting with the present and working backwards, but that in, includes new data that are coming in like this week, all the DEMOS observations, we, we, I'll put them through at the end of the week, I'll put them through this pipeline. But um, there are others on the team from SIP, uh, um, some of the SIP mentors are running it, are running the early DEMOS mass from 2002 forward. So we've got to meet somewhere in the middle and uh, have all the DEMOS data that we've run through PyPit. That's our goal. I haven't had a chance to speak with Roy about um, revising the WS abstract. I saw an abstract, but I, I want to discuss that with the two of you and make some, um, some substantial edits to the, the abstract. When yeah, that would be great. Um, the deadline is November 30th. Okay, so we have a bit of time. If we can do it yeah. um, early next week, that would be great. Like the 21st, 20th. Yeah, sounds good to me. The idea. If you could please set up a time and uh, after school for you, evenings for me would be best. If that works for Roy and the three of us can meet and we can just hammer it out, be done with the Yeah, um, I don't have school next week because of Thanksgiving. So anytime next week, really. All right, let's do it in the evenings anyway, because uh, I have a, uh, yeah, I have a pretty packed schedule of meetings during the day. Okay. Um, how late in the evening should it be? Let me look at my calendar. So 21st is, let me see. The 22nd is really better for me than the 21st, but in, mm -hmm. on either day, sometime after six would be best. Okay, sounds good. I'll text Roy. No, I don't think it will take more than an hour to both um to show you guys the format of the reduced spectra and to uh, you know re rewrite the abstract but i'd like um, to do also what is the process for making an eye poster um, the WS provides a platform in which you can you know plug in text and figures it's a very nice platform So it's not, well, it's not something like not something standard like PowerPoint or Word or it's not a, not a like a Google Doc format. It's it's their own format sort of thing. They have some I forget what it's what the platform is called, but it's offered by them. Um, let me see. Actually, uh, let's see. They're going to say about the abstract. Oh, yeah. My goal is when we meet to go over some of the 
structural changes to the abstract, you know, approach it differently than, than you guys have so far. Let you take a second stab at writing it, and then I'll give you detailed comments. Just want to talk. Yeah, that sounds great to me. Let's do that. So, yeah, either the 21st, so I'm just looking at my calendar on the 21st, anytime between five and eight, Sorry. or after nine. So five to eight or after nine, and then on the 22nd, anytime after six. Okay. Also, Raja, I had a question. Um, yeah. It's about SIP this year. How did it go? What are the stats? Uh, I haven't really been in touch about SIP stuff, but I can see you have like posters for the AAS this year too. That's great. Yeah. Um, so it was a modest increase in the in size this year compared to last year, three thirteen to three twenty six. So it's a very small increase. Uh, three thirteen in twenty twenty one. Um which is more than it was in 2020. 2020, it was 225, the year you took part. Uh, 313 in 2021, 326 in 2022, it's the number of students. We had you know, plenty of astro projects. Um, so it was a good summer, it was pure virtual. 2020, 2021, and 2022 have been purely virtual. This is for um, our, no, it was still eight weeks of active research, two weeks of research, but that structure is the same. Next year, 2023, we're gonna do two weeks of research prep, completely online, but the remaining eight weeks will have the option, every student will have the option of being completely in person, completely online or hybrid, some combination of the two, some part, in, on, some part on campus, some part from home. Yeah, that's a great thing. Um, I feel like for me, like I wouldn't have, like participated if it wasn't virtual. So exactly. I feel like exactly. having the virtual option makes it really accessible for people who do not have the resources otherwise. Yeah, that's it, really it, cool. It also gives mentors flexibility. Same reasons, exactly the same reasons. You know, the mentor has travel for part of the summer, conferences, they can structure it so that part of the work is remote, part of it is in person. I know everyone prefers yeah. in person, but this is a compromise. And I was wondering, like, how is like the stuff going with the project that I worked on? We are um, moving forward with that. This is the week on stars. Um, yeah, we should give you an update. Um, someone who's not here in Hawaii today, one of my grad students, has been working hard on the uh, on the. He's found these stars in the Large Magellanic Cloud. We've been talking to our collaborators in Italy who build stellar models. And we have, there's some confusion over what produces this feature in the spectrum. Uh, we don't know what the underlying physical mechanism is. At one point, they thought it was rotation in massive stars that was causing it. No longer sure of that. So um, the underlying physical interpretation is still cloudy. But the um, phenomenon is clear as day. You worked on M33 and M31. It's, it's clear, clear in those two galaxies, but it's even clearer in the Large Magellanic Cloud. So that's where things are. Um, there's a AAS poster being presented by Antara uh, on, on this. She's an undergraduate at Harvard. So she's been working on this. She is... Also, I think in her second year. Because when I wrote letters for you, I also wrote letters for Antara that year. Yeah. She's also class of 2025. Do you know her? Uh, not personally. I think the only interaction with uh, that I had with her was through SIP, but like not too much because I think she did most of the work before. Before, yeah. So it she was, was like a, a lot of, yeah. Yeah. it was the code that I got from That's her. Right. She was based in Mumbai. She lived in Mumbai, not Delhi. And, but she was also, I think, might have been an alumni buddy. I'm not certain. Yeah, I tried being an alumni buddy last year, but 
like Tendril and I, our schedules just wouldn't work out with anything. So that was not the best. But that's why this year I took it. Like I just took it. Like I took. It, I just didn't do it. But yeah, yeah. no, no, no. It's cool. no, no. Where is Tendril now? She is in the U.S., right? Yeah, I think she's at Purdue, and I think she's right, doing Purdue. aerospace. Right, right, right. Yeah, I stay in touch with her. Very good, very good. Um, I was in Delhi briefly this summer in August. Um, for uh, I'd gone for a conference in Hyderabad, but then I stopped by in Delhi with our admissions group from UCSC. Um, and I'll do that again next August. So if you happen to be in Delhi, then. I will be. And it, it's really hot in August. You chose the perfect month. Well, it was post-monsoon, so it wasn't as bad. Um, so we were in Kolkata. I was supposed to go to Madras. Uh, sorry, I was supposed to go to Mumbai and Pune. I skipped those two. In Kolkata, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Delhi. Yeah, if you're there in August, let me know. I probably will be there if I'm not taking any summer classes. So this, or... this conference we go to is in late August. And I know UCLA, UCLA schedule is the same as ours. You know, we're on the same quarter schedule. So you start classes in late September. Yeah. So go back to... Yeah, we have a ton of AAS posters again. And this time it's, we're going in person. Oh, many people are going in person. It's in Seattle. It's after you come back from India. It's actually from the 8th to the 12th of um, January. That's why I was asking if you're already in research, but maybe in the future, if you're doing a research project, you could present it at the AAS. So I was going to share my screen again. There's something, some problem with this part of the spectrum here, but otherwise I see the calcium triplet very clearly. So let's see what's going on in this part of the spectrum. There'll probably be some clue in the 2D spectrum. Whoa, see how crowded it is. Oh, look what's happened here. There's a, this tilt is a sign that the something wrong with the trace. Laura, I've got to show you something. Sorry for it to interrupt. It's an example of a bad reduction. Okay, so first of all, a very, very crowded slate, right? Oh yeah, and uh, I think the star in question is this this one right here, not mm -hmm. not the upper one, but the lower one. You can see the extraction windows is good over here, doesn't look so good over yeah. here. Looks good, but see what happens to the. So I looked at the spectrum first, and I said, okay, um, yeah, let's see. Some of it looks fine, you know, like this is titanium oxide here, mm -hmm. calcium triple, but something went wonky over here, mm -hmm. and the chip gap is right there. Now this is the zero. You see the zero level there. Yeah. That's the chip gap. So on the blue part, so when I notice this, I've never seen this before. Okay, so notice how the spectra look fine over here. They look fine over there. Yeah. Many stars, of course. Mm -hmm. Let's see what starts to happen here. Oh, yes. Stilt, yeah. yeah. So it means it traced the slit incorrectly. Mm -hmm. Incorrectly, yeah. Um, so that is unusual. I've never seen that. I've never seen that. I've never seen this kind of tracing error. So I don't know what's going, uh, what caused that, mm -hmm. but you can imagine that if you draw an extraction window, it'll pick up some other star. Yeah. It'll drop the star in question, pick up mm -hmm. a neighbor. If it weren't for a neighbor, it would just drop. Yeah. But here, I think what's happening is it starts to drop uh, over here, then it picks up a neighbor and then it gets yeah. off that neighbor and then it hits the good part of the CCD, which is the yeah. red half, so. Interesting. So, I mean, it doesn't affect the velocity measurement, but you can yeah. imagine you take this and try to measure a metallicity from this, it could completely mess up, you know? Yeah. So I'll make a note saying that the spectrum is bad. There's a bad, this is called bad trace. Mm -hmm. And the spectrum is bad from about something like 7,400 
out to 8,000. Mm -hmm. So I've been, you know, there's some other bad traces, but uh, it's more obvious. You can see I've got a bad trace here on the blue side. I've got mm -hmm. a few examples of bad traces on the blue side. And one of the things that Carrie and I, I, you know, Carrie, you and I were talking about the other day is I think this would be a great student project to say, let's take all these bad cases. Let's look at the pipette counterpart. Yes. Let's see how it did that. And, you know, the other thing is there's so much information being thrown away here. 2D, uh, uh, spec 2D is just picking out the spectrum of the star. It's not doing anything with the, or we are not doing anything with the CERN dips here. But pipette is picking out all the CERN dips. They should, mm -hmm. I bet there'll be a good velocity for this star. Oh, yeah. There's these, there's two here actually, uh, and this one here. Get good sure. velocities for all of them. You can see the two when you come up here. You can see this one has a TIO band. The lower one oh, doesn't. Yeah. No, the lower one doesn't. You can very clearly see that. Yeah. All right. That's great. And yeah, I think I agree. This is the exact sort of thing that a student project would be great for. Yeah, you see these two stars again. The lower one has looks like it's steady. All the way through, this one has this TIO dip here, and then it picks up in brightness here. It completely outshines the lower star over here. So it's clearly two separate stars. So one, two, three. This is a very faint continuum. I doubt Pipet will pick that up. But one, two, three, and will separate two mm -hmm. and three? I don't know. But it will certainly, this fourth one here, it should separate from the target. And um, then I don't know, below on the red side, there's, you know, I mean, even though there's not much blue flux on the red side, there is something. So these are the sorts of slits we're getting. They're very crowded, but we're, in spite of all this, we've got a good velocity for this star. Excellent. Uh, you know, again, it's minus 174. M M80, M32's velocity is minus 180. So uh -huh. it's dead on, it's right. Excellent. So. Okay. I'm sorry to bring you about that. Right, but um, yeah, go ahead, please tell yeah. me. Talk me through so, the difference between uh, the blue spectra and the white spectra and how you're using it. Of course, sure. Let me mm -hmm. go back to sharing my screen. And Gail, I don't know if you've seen this display of the spectra before. Okay, so this is um, uh, it's using a, a programming language called IDL, interactive data language. And, it's displaying 2D and 1D spectra. So let's go back to the spectrum. I'm going to share my screen again. So the, the white spectrum is a spectrum of a star in Andromeda that we didn't know anything about before this. It's the first time anyone's had taken a spectrum of that star. And the blue or the cyan spectrum is a template. It's a star with of known velocity. And you can see that if I if we apply a Doppler shift of minus 174.5, the dips in the blue spectrum and the white spectrum line up. This is produced by calcium, singly ionized calcium, calcium ions. Um, and that's really the goal of this is to measure the radial velocity. So from that standpoint, it worked fine. But from a different standpoint, you can see that the, this part of the spectrum, the white spectrum looks nothing like the blue spectrum. And it's not because the white spectrum, the star is different, but because the measurement messed up. You can see that the, this is what I was pointing out to Lara, look at how tilted these, li these black lines are meant to be parallel to the bottom line, uh, bottom horizontal line, and they're clearly not parallel. Because what is happening is we take this 2D spectrum, we take the flux within these red markers, these two red markers, and we collapse it into intensity as a function of wavelength. So this red marker does fine all along here. You can see as long as our thing is running parallel, it does fine. But the moment this starts to curve down, that red marker um, falls in this gap instead sort of on the spectrum here. And then it starts picking up this one, the upper star, and then it loses that one as well. And that's what you're seeing here, is it first starts losing the main star, it picks up its neighbor, loses the neighbor. And all of this is because of a data reduction error, not, not because this some, is not telling us about the astrophysics of the star, but rather a software failure. 
Um, so when it went back to being normal again, did it pick up something else completely different or did it go back to the original one? So um, that's a great question. So what's happening here is if you, um, you can see two bands, right? There's an upper band here and a lower band. These are two parts of the same spectrum, uh, two parts of the spectrum of the same star. This is the short wavelength part. This is the long wavelength part. So the long wavelength part is just fine. You can see the lines are completely horizontal all the way through. Um, and the lower band, everything is fine. The upper band is where we have this problem and neither Lara nor I have seen this problem ever before. So this is sort of an unusual failure mode for the software. So yes, the lower part of the spectrum, the long wavelength part of the spectrum is just fine. That's in 1D. It's this part of the spectrum from 8,000 to 8,800. This part of the spectrum is just fine. And that's why, that's why we can reliably measure the calcium triplet and say that, yeah, we have a good velocity. So I'm going to give it a secure star velocity of four and make a note here of what went wrong. So there's a bad trace. Uh, it's a very bad so trace. So is there a way to fix this by doing, yeah. or do you just have to take a new? So we could do a one-off fix of this, but instead we're running an entirely different software package that's Python-based. And that's exactly what Lara and I were saying is all these problem cases, I'm making a note of it. We'll see if the Python version of the reduction software did a better job. Our general impression is the Python code is better documented, better written, better supported. So these sorts of issues are not happening as frequently. And even in spite of the severe problem, it's not a loss. We've measured the velocity. We just can't use certain parts of the spectrum. And that's exactly what I'm about to note here. So I'm writing, it's a very bad trace. And I'm writing in shorthand. And then I'm saying that the spectrum is bad. V spec means the spec bad spectrum for a certain portion of the spectrum. From 73 or 7,400. Maybe to be safe, 7350 to 8000. So this note tells me, tells others that don't use this part of the spectrum, okay, for any analysis. So to see if I understood you correctly, so the star, the the target is moving 174.5 kilometers per second uh, with respect to the star that we know of. Uh, with respect to what, sorry? To the star that's, uh, to, let's go to the star with the blue spectrum. Oh, yes. The, mm -hmm. the blue spectrum, the original version of the blue spectrum was at zero velocity. And so we had to shift it by 174 to match it up. Yeah. So that means mm -hmm. it's moving at that speed relative to the Earth. Okay. Makes sense. And that includes the motion of the Earth around the sun. So we'll have to make a correction for that. That's called the heliocentric correction. So we ultimately report the velocity of the star relative to the sun, not to the Earth. Okay, thank you. Because what happens is the Earth's velocity around the sun is 30 kilometers per second. And of course, its direction is changing constantly because the Earth is in a circular orbit. So what we measure for astronomical objects is usually corrected to the heliocentric frame so that you don't have to worry about the Earth's motion around the sun and different observers, if they correct to the same frame, they can agree they can they can decide whether their measurements agree or not. I count seven other stars spectra over here. OS is shorthand. I'll count them for you. One is the faint one at the bottom, near the bottom, if you can see my cursor. Then this one, two, three is the one. This the one with the red mark is the is the target star. So one, two, three, four, five. Oh, sorry, faint one here. One, two, three, four. This four is over here. Five, six, seven. 
So the white lines are the individual stars, right? The white. The dark stars. lines are. Oh, okay. This is a reverse video. So if I, this is how it would look in, um, if now in this mode, white represents more light and here black represents more light. I'm looking at it in reverse video. Okay, so the dark parts are. Yeah, red. one. Like so this star. is a faint star. This is a faint star. One, two are faint. The, the, this is the target. I'm going to ignore that because we've already measured its velocity. But the first two serendipitous detections are faint. The third one is really bright. So what I'm going to write over here is faint, faint, bright, strong. That's what I've been writing. Then so that's the third one. The fourth one is moderate because you can see it over here. The next two are next three are strong. I feel like I can finally understand the notes you were making two years ago. Yeah, yeah, you remember that? Yeah, I remember coming to those sessions when you were observing and being so lost. I, I understood it faintly that what's happening, but I didn't understand what's actually happening on the screen. And I remember looking at your notes and always asking you about like specific words that you wrote, but I never like fully understood what's happening. And I think oh, you're now getting a better I can sense. kind of see. Yeah. Yeah. I'm writing here that five and six are close to each other, these two. These are five and six. So one, two, three, four, five and six are close to each other, and then seven is off by itself. Now, oh, and then I forgot the word continuum at the end. Anyway, these are very cryptic. These are more to flag problems and figure out, like this tells us there are, there should be a total of eight spectra from this slit, the target plus seven others, up to seven others. And so that way, when we use the other software, we can see how well it did on those. All right, I'm going to go check what's going on with them. I'll be right back. You guys look worried. What's happening? So, if you zoom in, yeah. So it seems we must be able to do something like this. Yeah, V shape. V shape. V shape. Just like that. See my box that's up. So, so I think you know it was like a is uh, there is uh, the way the metal plate is from the metal plate actually has a cup like this, but the metal plate goes here. Red plate is rectangular mm -hmm. over here, but um, on the spec, light is a mm -hmm. So you're seeing that the, the background of the box, which is just sky mm -hmm. right, it's not completely red, it's cut off. It worked fine as an alignment box, the star is centered, mm -hmm. the stars are flying. So. The same measurement for that one is that we can use the other one as well. Looks so faint, so this should be fine. Should be reliable. This is good. No, but this should be good. These are if you look at these are all even yeah. even for that one, we should be able to measure a reliable scene for these. Uh, for the individual stars, yeah. I think we should do a Myra yeah. after this. Yeah, that's why we should do it. So, what we can do is uh, so we want to take control C on the sequence, and that won't stop the exposure. Yeah. But after this, we can ask what to do a Myra. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's common. The mm -hmm. and I to do a focus, the seeing has dropped a lot. Let's, yeah. I, I bet the actual seeing now is much better than 0.86. Yeah, it's probably better mm -hmm. than 0.76. So, 
So now we could, of course, not put this in this perspective. I mean, the scene is not the best person. No. What, what are you getting for something you could do some of the things you said? Watch the Friday at 6 o'clock. What do you think? Like to do a Myra, I would say an hour west of here because we'll be staying on this street for two hours. This street. We're about to, we are in about a minute to be ready. As soon as the six Yeah, let's go an hour. Let's go an hour and a half west, actually, because we'll be on the street for until 12 o'clock. So let's go an hour and a half west. So what that means is, instead of having first appointed where it is, it's going to be somewhere else an hour and a half from now. So that'll be the middle of the next three hours or so. Or go after this explosion. Good. Yeah, we've stopped the sequence mm -hmm. and in 30 seconds we'll be ready to stop. As soon as this exposure yeah. starts reading out these social you've seen that you know the they've seen in the dark, but you're not seeing that with most of them. What did you get from the last one? Like But if, if you do it, it's not the good one. All right, we're ready to move to the fire. I, I bet it's good. It just takes time. Back, you guys. Yeah, the, what, what we are str struggling with at the telescope is uh, the quality of stellar images, how blurry or sharp they are, um, is what we are trying to, what we are sort of working on. We think the telescope is not as in as sharp focus as it can be, and so we are refocusing the telescope right now. How do you refocus the telescope? We is the royal. We are not doing a thing here, yeah, but you know, others are doing this. So they run this process called Myra, stands for Mirror Alignment. Uh, the, the telescope is made of these thirty-six segments, and um, those thirty-six segments are hexagonal, and they they form um, a hyper uh, hyperboloid, I believe. It's a Sort of a conic section that it forms, and then after light bounces off that, it hits a, a convex secondary mirror. And the way the telescope is focused is you can change the distance between the um, convex mirror and the the secondary mirror and the primary mirror, the convex secondary mirror and the concave primary mirror. Change the distance between them, but you can also tilt the uh, the secondary mirror relative to the primary tip and tilt. So tilt along two different axes plus the piston motion. Those are the three degrees of freedom. And so but they have an interesting way of making this happen. If the if the secondary mirror is in the perfect position, perfect tip, perfect tilt, then what should happen is if you deliberately make the 36 segments of the Keck telescope from where it should be open like this. If you make it too closed or too open, instead of getting a single image of a star, you'll get 36 images of the star, one formed by each segment and not perfectly coincident. But so what they do is they deliberately take the telescope and make it slightly too open, slightly too closed. And 
If everything is in perfect focus, you can get exactly the same pattern of stars. Um, but um, you know, you get the 36 pattern stars. Um, or oh, one should be a mirror image of the other. When it's too closed, then you know, light from this segment is landing to the left, this one is landing to the right, and vice versa if it's too open, right? But you get the the separation of stars in that pattern should be identical if the telescope's perfectly focused. So they do that with the primary. And then by looking at the asymmetry of the two images, they calculate how much the secondary mirror should be, where it should be positioned, how it should be tilted. So that process is called a MIRA, M-I-R-A, stands for mirror alignment. Um, a long time ago, it used to be called malign, mirror aligned, and people said, no, that's not a good name. So they changed it to MIRA. Uh, MIRA is also the name of the star. So that's what they're doing now, they're doing the MIRA. Now we, we, we were starting a, three times 20 minute exposures of a, a sequence on a mask in N31. But after the first 20 minutes, we stopped it. So let's let's see if we can improve the next two. Um, because even though you lose some time in focusing the telescope, you get better quality data afterwards and that makes more than makes up for the time spent in refocusing the telescope. So that's what's happening. It takes about five, 10 minutes to focus, refocus, and then once they do that, they we're back to taking more exposures. I'm not sharing the control software today for a technical reason. I'm, I'm on a, I have to switch my VPN to do that, and I'm in the middle of doing something else on a on a different VPN that doesn't allow me to share. So that, that's that's why I'm not sharing my screen. Not because I'm trying to keep away from you guys, but it's just uh, there's a software that's been running for a while, and I don't want to kill it. I had a question about just adaptive optics in general. I know you mentioned it earlier, like at the start of the session. You didn't like really like elaborate on it, but I remember like hearing about adaptive optics in my astro class. And I was wondering like how it is used um, or if it is used here. The recording of a person saying it, yeah. It used to be Sharon Schultz a long time ago. I don't know who this voice is. Sharon Schultz used to work here when tech was started. I used to, I knew Sharon Schultz. When she was famous. Her voice would yeah. would be the one saying, "Mirror is not aligned." You know, she would say all these scary things. <laughs> and then I don't know what I don't know what voice is being used now. You need someone really sounds serious, like, like Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman, yeah. Or James Earl Jones, you know, yeah. Darth Vader. You know. George, George, George. George. Yeah, I mean, Your image is just that beautiful. That was the thing, like cameos, it was called, yeah. where you could fit in, like celebrities to say. <laughs> so you're seeing, um, when I share my screen, you guys, you're seeing some of the reductions that I'm running with Pipet. Uh, I share my screen again. This is uh, Pipet running. Uh, I'm actually, this is just a secure copy running, but Pipet is running on. Um, I, have, I have a window that's keeping track of what is running right now. Six what? Six? Six eight. Six eight. Okay. Still better, better than median. Um. So Yael, what you're seeing here is everything that is, that's under the category, I say mostly done because there were two crashes, but, and there's not such a note. And um, you see uploaded to Pemla, it means not only have I done the reductions, they're up, they're downloaded to my local machine, this laptop that I'm using now, they've also been uploaded to my server. And I'm going to, I haven't done this yet. I'm also gonna upload them to a Google Drive folder that you and Roy will be able yeah. to access. And all this, you can see bright, on certain nights, all we observe are bright 
PS1 RLI from the monitoring program. You can see on the 20th, 21st, 22nd. All of these have been reduced. All of them have been uploaded to my server, but I haven't uploaded them to Google Drive yet. Some of these are still being reduced. Um, you can, uh, or some of them haven't been uploaded yet. The, all of these have been reduced. Everything over here has been reduced. These have not yet started. These are in progress. So this is sort of my way of keeping track of things. But everywhere where you see bright PS1 RLRA, that's what the monitoring program is. So for example, on the 20, in 2020, right. November 7th. Uh, what was that? And we should be able to go directly to a fine alignment. We don't have to do a course. That this AP mark base should be there. It's so cool to see the image of the 36 images. Um, So you can so you, you can see that I'm done with all the 20, 22 observations so far, not including tonight. Done with all of the 2021 reductions, except for two masks that failed, but it doesn't affect your bright PS1 R Larry. They were observed there, 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 there are four of the nights, one, two, three, four. And if there's no comment about them, that means they're reduced fine. We have many nights in September where that's all we observed. And then on the other nights in September, we also observed, right? Every time we see bright PS1 R Larry, it means they were observed. And I can share this, this document with you. It's just a simple text document. So for yeah, example, on 20, 2022, October 18, these are UT dates. There was no bright PS1 R Larry observation that night, but there was the, the next night on the 19th, on the 28th, 29th. So, and on the 28th, actually, we got lots of measurements because it was a cloudy night, and so we observed. All they did was observe PS1 RLRA. Then below that is just notes. These are more for my uh, remembering things, etc. This has got, yeah, these have got, uh, they don't, they're not greatly significant to the rest of the team, but my own internal bookkeeping. Sort of my, if you like my electronic data reduction yeah. log. So I'm currently re reducing October 2019. 2022 though. Oh, not reducing, sorry, uploading. Probably more interesting to look at the spectra. And... Back. Oh, as I said, It doesn't remember what you're oh, 
it's going to assume that exclude for all time yeah. because there's some bad column. Yeah. CP readout complete. That could be complete. Dropbox. And seeing it doesn't matter with me. It's not suggesting. Here it is. Well, I saw something on LinkedIn that said you graduated high school already. How can that be? Oh, yeah. A couple of people have texted me about that. I don't know what happened. Sorry. I didn't change anything, but LinkedIn decided that I'm done with high school. What was that? Sorry, say that again. I, I didn't. I don't think I changed anything, but LinkedIn decided that I graduated. But I wasn't told of this. So I don't know. Did, did others tell Maybe you this? Maybe I or, did. Did others tell you this or did, am I the first yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. You're like the fifth person to tell oh, me about this in like the past couple hours. It's quite funny. Yeah, I noticed that. I said I was better ask you what <laughs> happened. Um, my trip to Israel, by the way, is finalized. I'm going on the, I'm traveling on the second, arriving on the third, coming back on the ninth. That's Early on the ninth, I'm there through the eighth. Yeah, I'm just going later in the month. One of the things I want to try and do when I'm there is see if there are, you know, folk, uh, try, to, try to find connections to students who are outside the urban centers, outside Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and particularly students who are impacted by the conflict on both sides of the conflict on Palestine and the Israeli side, uh, to see if we can bring some of this work there. If you know anyone there who's working with, um, sort of lack of a better word, impacted groups of students, let me know. I'll look out for it, but I lived in a very urban place. Where was that, Tel Aviv? Um, I lived about 20 minutes out from Tel Aviv. So it's okay. still a very big city, yeah. Yeah, but you know, if you know people who are working in, especially educators who are working in, in, in these areas or people who may have connections to educators who are working in these areas, let me know. Um, I, uh, one of my daughter's professors at Brown was, her uh, research was, would bring her to Palestine and she, she spoke fluent Arabic and on one of our trips to Israel, she had taken us to, on a small tour in East Jerusalem and I'll reach out to her as well to ask. And then I, I have a very close friend who lives in, um, he lives outside Tel Aviv. He lives sort of almost all the way to Haifa, so quite a bit north of Tel Aviv. But so I'm going to spend. Do you know a like which city? Because I, I also live north of Tel Aviv. Uh, I should put you in touch with him. Um, he he's the director of the Wise Observatory at Tel Aviv University at Tau. Um, 
I put his name in the chat. That's great. Yeah, a lot of the way the Israeli school system works is that in high school, a lot of the schools are specialized. Uh -huh. So there might be like some like specialized like science or engineering schools that could be very interested in this kind of stuff and could point us in the right direction. No, that would be great, of course, because, uh, you know, um, as you know, even in the Bay Area, there are some really science focused schools like Harker and, um, and but, but they're also public schools that, which have students like yourself. Um, so I'm um, in particular, I'm interested in bringing uh, these opportunities to students who don't have any kind of research connection. Um, yes, I, I agree. It would be of interest to schools that are more science focused as well. Um, yeah, but also they could just like point us towards who we should be talking to for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Any help mm -hmm. you could bring to this would be great. So, uh... Sorry, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, yeah, Lord, go ahead. So I've pitched this idea to a couple of the staff and they would also like to join in. Uh, can they join in on the Zoom link? Yes, of course. They're welcome mm -hmm. to join. Would be best if they were to sign up through the Google form so we can, sure. we can know uh, who's interested. Just it helps us keep track of, um, you know, the people of, Turn interest in this. Mm -hmm. That if they are a bit lazy and they just want to join in on the Zoom, that's fine. It's not a problem. I mean, mm -hmm. even if they fill out the Google form afterwards, just so they, um, you know, so they're registered with us, that would be helpful. Okay, I'll talk to them about it. Um, so I've also. also... Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I've also been talking to a couple of uh, primary schools, a couple, I talked to one, I'm planning to talk to others. Yeah. So um, there are going to be something like 12, 12 year old, 13 year old students. Can, are you able to, to talk with them and show them something maybe? <laughs> I think so. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things to decide is whether an open session like this is best for students who are that young, or whether we should have a dedicated session that explains things at the level of a you know, 10 or 12 year old. The latter might be better, have a dedicated session. Yeah, I think, I think that, that could work. So we'll keep chatting about it and then we'll see what happens. Sounds good, oh, that sounds good. So what here, you were gonna say something? Oh, I just had this question that I asked earlier, but I think you didn't, uh, hear it. Uh, I was just wondering about adaptive optics. Uh, I think you mentioned the word, like the, the phrase at the beginning, but I remember like learning about it a little bit in class, but I obviously like don't understand how it's like actually used. Yeah. And I was wondering if it's used here. I think it is, right? We're not using it tonight. And it's it is used on CAC, it's used on LIC, um, but it's rare for it to be used. It's not used every night. Uh, Andrea uses it for her research, um, for the work she does. She, she used to use a different technique before called speckle imaging, but she uses yeah, she adaptive optics that more. In class very briefly, just it was one slide. That's why I was curious because um, it's so, pretty cool. Uh, I can explain what the technique is uh, through sort of an analogy. Now, um, imagine you're looking, I mean, when you're, when you're looking at the, at a star, it's analogous to looking at a light source from the bottom of a swimming pool, literally from the bottom of the swimming pool where there's water above you, right? So the light rays are bending when they meet the water, the air water interface. And since the water surface is not static, you know, since it's constantly moving, the image of the star is dancing around, you know, and it's actually mangled into multiple pieces because you can a good way to think of it is you can imagine that the at any point in time the water surface can be thought of as a series of planes and each plane is directing the light differently in a different direction so from our perspective at the bottom of the swimming pool we see um, multiple images of the star 
at any at any given snapshot. These are called speckles, S P E C K L E S. These are called speckles. Now, if there's a particular part of this water surface that's got a large plane wave, that means that part will coherently send light into a single speckle. Whereas if there's a part that's a very small plane, then it's sending a small amount of light. So the speckles don't all have the same brightness. Okay. In, in particular, there's a primary speckle and then there are secondary speckles beyond that. The brighter speckle is always one brighter speckle and then everything else is fainter than that. Um, but um, this would be true if you were looking at a light source at the bottom of the pool from the from outside. You'd, it would be dancing. If the water surface were completely steady and flat, then you'd see fine. You know, you'd see, there'd be bending of light, so the apparent position would be different, but it wouldn't be mangled into multiple pieces. If the water surface, but you know, the Earth's atmosphere is like that water surface. The vacuum to air interface and sort of air to water interface is what we're talking about for, um, that's what causes stars to twinkle. Twinkle, twinkle, little star is exactly this, right? So adaptive optics is untwinkle, untwinkle, little star is what it is, right? So what you do is we know that the, you can't just make a correction and be done with it. It's a constantly changing thing. The water surface in that example of a swimming pool is constantly changing. The Earth's atmosphere is constantly changing. And the rate of change or the time period over which the, um, the characterization of the atmosphere is valid, you make a measurement and you can say, is it still valid? You find that it remains valid for about a millisecond, thousandth of a second. Okay. So you have to make these corrections at kilohertz rates, thousand times a second. Okay, now how do you make a correction? What you do is in the mangled image of the star is complete information on what that water surface is doing at that instant. If you could take pictures of a star every thousandth of a second, first of all, it would have to be a bright star. So you have enough photons to make a high signal to noise measurement of all the speckles. The, the positions and relative brightness of the speckles in that is contained exact information about the water surface or in the case of the atmosphere, the atmospheric distortion. So what happens is you create something called, uh, you create a small mirror in the light path that's almost as though it's made of mylar film. You can control the back with a zillion pistons. You can distort the shape of that reflective surface. It's called a DM, deformable mirror, to be equal and opposite to the Earth's atmosphere. So that mirror is designed to collapse those multiple pieces of the star into a single spot. It uses the mangled image to decide what its shape should be. Okay, so it's a closed loop system. However, you can't keep that loop closed constantly because the atmosphere would have changed. So you have to close the loop a thousand times a second. That's adaptive optics, that's how it works. So that's pretty cool. Oh. So you need a every time. Say that again. Why don't we use it every time? Like, won't, don't we need it every single time? Good question. Because um, adaptive optics is tricky, challenging to do. There aren't enough bright stars everywhere in the sky. You need a bright star to do this, and. When you make this correction for a bright star, the correction is valid only in a small region of the sky around that bright star. Because the light is coming from a region far away from it, it's traveling to a different part of the Earth's atmosphere. It's got different distortions. So uh, you need sort of these lampposts and you can do this correction around those lampposts. So, so there's this thing called laser guide stars where you create your own spot by shining a laser spot up into the upper atmosphere and then use that as a star. Um, so because there aren't enough bright stars, people use laser guide stars. Uh, you know, without getting into the technical details of it, adaptive optics is very expensive time-wise. You have to, um, you lose a lot of time just correcting the atmosphere. You're not spending all that time collecting photons. Okay. Um, the second reason is what it helps you with is the sharpness of the image how sharp the image is, how blurred or sharp the image is. If that's your main purpose, makes sense to use adaptive optics. 
If on the other hand, you're collecting light in order to take a spectrum like we're doing now, we don't care as much about how sharp the image is. We're using the 10 meter light bucket to collect as photons as efficiently as possible to create a spectrum, see? Uh, if I wanted to take the sharpest possible image with Keck, I would use adaptive optics and really do that for some of our projects and other people do that for their projects. For Andrea's work, for example, it's critically important because she's trying to get very high resolution images of the galactic center. I see, I, I see. I remember her mentioning that it's very, like it's not the most efficient uh, from a time perspective. Yeah. And so in the beginning when she started it, like she wouldn't get too much time with the telescope simply because she was not getting a lot of like data in general, but that, because yeah. it would take a lot of time. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Thank I remember so when much. Andrea and I first chatted about this, we were in a, in Hawaii and she was using the speckle method back then. And uh, that does throw away a lot of uh, light and it's efficiency wise is not the most efficient, but adaptive optics is better than that. But um, I mean, Andrea is an expert on adaptive optics and many other things. So she, she could give you a better explanation of why people don't use AO all the time. Um, Joel and Lord Rick and Nelson and Maxim, the person we're talking about is a professor at UCLA where um, Swathya studies. And Swathya was a SIP intern in 2020. Yael was a SIP intern in 2022. And you both worked on projects that I'm, I'm connected to. Um, both involved spectro stars. But the person who uh, we're talking about is a professor at UCLA, Andrea Gez. She got the Nobel Prize in Physics um, a couple of years ago for her work on the Galactic Center Black Hole. It's a shared prize with Two others. I think she got 25%. Uh, mm -hmm. Reinhard Gensel got 25%. And I forget who the third person was who I got the 50%. I think it was Penrose, I think. Roger Penrose, yeah. He got the yeah. 50% of it. Oh. It wasn't they're, 2020. They're all house. Like... Say that again, Swatya? It wasn't 2020. So 2020, the same yeah, two year as a SIP intern. Yeah. No, and it's, you know, it's one of those things where uh, those three names, Penrose, uh, Gensel, and uh, and Andrea Gez, their household names in astronomy have been for a long time. They've been working in astronomy for a while. I mean, I know all three of them from from different circumstances. You know, um, every time a, a Nobel Prize goes to an astronomer, it's great. You know them. Um, astronomy is a very small field. My my great grand doctoral advisor got the Nobel Prize, uh, Chandrasekhar. Um, my, you know, my good friend, John Matha, was someone I had started to work with. He got the Nobel Prize for the, discover, for the characterization of the afterglow from the Big Bang. I probably know about 20 Nobel Prize winners, but all, most of them are physics Nobel Prize winners. So, you know, one or two do, people in other fields. Do you happen to know a David Goldfinger? No. What subject? Uh, astronomer. Uh, from How do you spell Harvard, the last name? Uh, Goldfinger. G O L D F I N G E R. Yeah. I don't think I know the name. Got the Nobel Prize? No, no, not Nobel Prize. Um, he reached out to Weijing. He's moving to the Bay Area, and he reached out like saying that he was volunteering to help with their science on that team, like the astronomy part of it. So we were wondering if you knew him. No, tell me, tell me the context again. I missed that. Um, so I believe he's currently at Harvard but he's moving to the Bay Area and Weijing runs his school Science Olympiad team. And Science Olympiad has like an astronomy section within it. So uh, he volunteered to help out and like teach the, the team. I so we were so wondering if you knew him. I don't, and Weijing was, um, uh, was on your project, is it through? Uh, no, he was one on um, Yuting's other projects. Oh, I see, I see. Was he is from the STAR program or was he from Foothill? He was from Foothill College, right? Uh, was, yeah, or was he a SIP intern? No, he's a SIP intern. He's from Pali. Okay. No, I, I haven't come across that name. And the name Goldfinger is famous from a Bond movie. There's a Bond movie title <laughs> called Goldfinger. 
who it was about some villain who would kill people by covering them in gold so they couldn't breathe. Um, Nelson, we haven't heard from you. If you wanted to um, tell us how you found out about us and tell us a bit about yourself, that would be great. I have to figure out how to enable the microphone testing. Can, we can um, hear you fine, yeah. Oh, good, yeah. So what was it, last Thursday, a week ago? Roger, you were down in Monterey. Actually, Marina, for a little Marina, presentation Marina. we found. Yeah, we found out about your uh, sessions here, starting day one of four, plus a couple yeah. others. And uh, I could not resist to try to just plugging in a little bit late because we were out celebrating something else. <laughs> And so I'm plugging in with all the context having flowed by. And I imagine you're right now imaging and you're waiting for a 20 minute or whatever, how long or long. Yeah, we're taking, we're taking spectra. We're taking 20 minute long spectra. And the product looks something like the what I was showing you earlier on my when I was sharing my screen. Um, yes. You're we're taking spectra that look like these. Um, in fact, same galaxy, M31. Uh, just a little away from uh, its companion M32. This was very close to its companion M32. So you can see the name of this mask is M32RC1. You can see that up here in this uh, in this and section. How, how large how large a window or wedge of uh, of Andromeda are you taking? Uh, um, one by one degree or much much no, smaller? Much smaller than that actually. Um, about the radius. So it's a rectangle whose long axis is equal to the radius of the full moon. And whose- oh, 30 minutes. 30 arc minutes yeah. uh, is the diameter. So it's 16 arc minutes uh -huh. is the length of the rectangle and five arc minutes is the width of the rectangle. So it's a small region. Uh, Have I mean, you been analyzing any of your data or are you just in the process of collecting it and talking about it and analyzing it later? No, you know, we've been analyzing. We've been analyzing and we've written papers on them. Um, not, we haven't written papers based on any of the data collected this year, but um, we've written papers on um, slightly older data and mm -hmm. we're constantly improving our analysis and as we do this. So uh, since you asked, I have, I have one more thing to comment about your presentation last Thursday. I was uh, absolutely amazed that there are many, many stars well outside the confines of the Milky Way at 100,000 light year diameter, you know, a quarter million to a, a half a million light years out there, our, our layer, I guess. One, one million even. Uh, even a million, that's, that's amazing. That's the halo of the galaxy. Halo of the Milky Way, that's right. We're finding our area of those Way. distances. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Belong to the Milky that Way. Was new, that was new to me, so really appreciate it. New, new to the whole world. We're, we're doing a press release on this. At the uh, January WS meeting, randomly discovered stars out there. How was there? How was Not it? Not randomly, uh... systematically searched. Um, mm -hmm. We have images. Uh, in that case, images, not spectra. Images in four different filters: you know, ultraviolet, green, and two infrared filters, or far red and infrared. So four filters, and we take we have repeat images, so you can see if something is varying in brightness. We use that to search, and we found about 200 stars, and the most distant of them. Um, we expected to find about 200 stars because other people have been doing surveys of our area as well, but we found the most distant ones of anyone, uh, or the most reliably distant ones of anyone. Other people have stars that could be that far away, but they don't put any faith in them because of the quality of their data. So it's the quality of our data that puts us in, in a great spot, not the volume of data, but the quality, not the quantity, but the now, quality. Now the, um, the database that Gaia has, has produced, did that play into that at all in any way? Not directly because Gaia is a small telescope and it can't study mm -hmm. stars that are this faint. And you know, uh -huh. here faintness yeah. is everything because we're looking for these very distant objects. Right. And uh, just to give you an idea, Gaia's faintest stars are about 20th magnitude. And the faintest stars we have are about 10 times fainter than that. 
22 and a half, 23, yeah. more than 10 times, 10 to 30 times fainter. And they're K and uh, M type stars? More like uh, late A through late F. Because uh, when, uh, when they go on the horizontal branch and pulse like this, they're actually quite hot because you're seeing into the uh -huh. inner core of the star. Ah, okay. Uh, they've Thank lost you. their outer layers. So, Roger, I was doing a presentation yesterday um, mm -hmm. just to brief the undergrads on the, uh -huh. the Shadow Science program. So, I think uh, one of the students asked me exactly what, what we're going to be observing. So, I think we talked about this in our last meeting. You told me observing some stars at the far end of the Milky Way. Uh, say the last phrase again. Some stars that are? At the far end of the Milky Way. Um, that we will be on the night of the 25th in Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, which is exactly the stars that uh, Nelson was talking about here. So we'll be looking at Aralari on the 25th of November. It'll be 26th in Tanzania, but 25th in Hawaii. Hmm. Okay. So I, I think I have to clarify that because the student asked me uh, uh, where exactly, because he, he had a bit of confusion. He thought it was the end of the universe. I told him the end of the, of the galaxy. <laughs> and uh, I told him they're probably something like 100,000 light years away. So it turns out they're not. <laughs> I, I should probably go and... Clarify. The ones we're studying are not quite a million light years away. The ones we're taking spectra of, because the ones that are mm -hmm. a million light years away are too faint for us to get spectra. But the okay. most distant ones we're getting spectra of are about 500,000 light years away. So we're working between okay. about uh, 250,000 and 500,000 light years from there. Mm -hmm. So in, in kiloparsecs, 80 to 150 kiloparsecs, whereas the most distant stars okay. we found are a little over 300 kiloparsecs away. Oh, okay. That's, that makes sense. That's good. I think should, and and I Roger, should... all these stars that you're imaging are in the gravitational field of the Milky Way galaxy. They correct? look that way. We're trying to make velocity measurements to make sure that that's the case. But uh, one hint is their density, their number per unit volume, falls off with increasing distance, which suggestive of an association with the Milky Way. If there was some random population that's around the Milky Way, there's no reason their density should be falling off with distance from the center. And possibly there are remnants of an interaction between the Magellanic clouds and the Milky Way. Um, some could be. The direction we, in which we found the stars are opposite to the where the Magellanic clouds are because we're in the Northern Hemisphere, Magellanic clouds are in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh -huh. So um, right. they're affected by the pull of the Magellanic cloud on these stars, but what we're studying is, um, yeah, uh, these are, they're accreted remains of other galaxies, not the Magellanic clouds, but other other smaller galaxies even. They're almost certainly the products of, of cannibalism galactic. This is another spectrum that is not very well matched. I'm seeing the same. Oh, that's because it found another object in the same. It's the same slit. You see, this is called Serendip 5. Serendip 5 right there. Guys, I'm going to sign off a little early because we have another shadow session starting in an hour and 15 minutes. I need to go and take care of a few things. But um, 
Yeah, and please set up that uh, meeting with Roy on either Tuesday, or Monday or Tuesday evening. Um, worst case, I can do it later in the week. Um, you know, not on Thanksgiving Day, but Wednesday would work also. Uh, I'll be in SoCal, but I can connect from there. Um, so let's, you know, but Monday or Tuesday would be great if we can. And I want you guys to have a little bit of time to iterate on the abstract after we talk so that you can, and then I, so we can do a final, final round of editing. Sounds great. Um, Nelson, thanks for connecting. Maxim, Lodric, Swatya, it's amazing surprise to see you. I saw, I expected to see you on the Zoom call because I saw you registered, but um, so wonderful surprise. Thanks. I'll send you an email, but yeah, thank you for doing thank this. You. Yeah, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Right, Bye, thank you. Thank you. I was just curious on how many corners of the of the world were represented here, Tanzania and elsewhere. Tanzania, um, Swatia. Uh, so that's where Lodric is. Uh, Swatia. My connection with her goes back to when she was in Delhi. She was a high school student in Delhi. She's now at UCLA. Um, um, a connection through. Sacramento, that's where um, Maxim was connected through. Nelson, your connection is from Marina, California. Who else was there? Oh, Yael is at, in Northern California. She was a high school student in our program. So Tanzania and India, uh, indirectly India, Swatia. Yeah. Okay. But uh, our next... Uh, um, yeah, this was a small session because we, I think for some reason, the um, uh, reminder got sent out very late, very close to tonight. So hopefully next few nights we'll have a few more. Okay, well, thanks for hosting it. I'm going to be signing off also. Thank you. Take care, Nelson. Bye-bye. Roderick, I'll uh, take care.